One of the more embarrassing moments in my working life was a few years into my career in information technology at a Fortune 5 company. A week earlier, my boss had asked I'd be interested in moving into a role where I would build and steward financial plans for senior management. He told me my name would be put into a hat for the role, so it wasn't guaranteed. Naturally, uh, this seemed like a way that I could move up for my role as a software engineer. So after praying about it, I said yes. A few days later, I was invited to a meet and greet with the most senior leaders of the IT organization, those that reported to the chief information officer. Now, this was both exciting and terrifying for me as I had recently begun experiencing anxiety attacks. Um, they were sort of sporadic, except for when it really mattered. Then, of course, they were quite consistent at the worst possible time. Uh, I had you know, recently started taking the prescription reflux medication, so my reflux was new and the anxiety attacks were new. Um, sadly, I didn't really put two and two together. Uh, unfortunately, uh, luck was not on my side. Uh, in fact, my anxiety was in overdrive for this event. Uh, I broke out in full body sweats through the entire event. Um, and in the course of an hour, I probably made 20 trips back and forth to the restroom, towel off and try to gain some shred of dignity. Now I was very sure after that cringeworthy performance uh, that there was no chance I'd be selected for the role. I mean, who breaks out into buckets of sweat during small talk? Now God clearly had my back on this one because I did get the job. Um, and over the next 15 years, however, my escalating physical and psychological issues were a constant trial as I took on increasing responsibility in my career. Um, these experiences are some of the reason that I'm so passionate about researching and sharing what I've learned about this terrible disease. In this episode, I want to talk about the connections between reflux and mood disorders, such as persistent anxiety, stress, and depression. Now, this pairing may seem odd to you at first, um, but if you think about it, we sort of intuitively and culturally understand the connection between our brains and our guts. I mean, just think about some of the language that we use to describe stressful situations, such as a kick in the gut, gut reaction, gut check, butterflies in the stomach, having a feeling in your gut and feeling gutted. And I'm very sure that you'd have at least at some point in your life been hangry, you know, when you're sort of hungry and hangry and kind of the words come together to make hangry. Never mind. Uh, but most of us have experienced gut-wrenching moments in our life. Um, and I'm referring to those moments in your stomach is tied in knots, your bowels loosen, and you may lose your appetite. Today's episode on anxiety uh, and gut health is really a broad topic. Um, it's broken up into three parts. Uh, part one is going to be about the enteric nervous system. Part two, about stress and the gut connection. Part three, learnings from medical research. And you can take a look at the timestamps in the show notes to jump to specific sections if you'd like. Now, before we dive in, uh, I do need to remind you that the information included in this show is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for medical treatment by a healthcare professional. Uh, because of the unique individual needs that you may have, listeners should really consult their physician to determine the appropriateness of information for their situation. Now, I really like this quote from the Institute of Functional Medicine. It says, connections between the brain and the gut abound, which are often apparent in the dysfunctions that unite them. Uh, many neurological mood disorders often have enteric manifestations. Now, this quote is referring to the enteric nervous system, uh, which is the brain of the digestive system, literally. I mean, the human brain has something like 86 billion neurons, uh, which enable it to process information and conduct the symphony that is the human body. The enteric nervous system has 500 million neurons of its own. Um, and in addition to choreographing the digestive function, it streams real-time updates, uh, leveraging its vast sensory network and uh, constant communication with the 100 trillion microbes that colonize our gut. And for this reason, scientists are increasingly referring to the enteric nervous system as our second brain. And normally, uh, the brain is content to allow the enteric nervous system to oversee gastrointestinal function uh, without interfering. Uh, when the body is subjected to stress, however, uh, the brain diverts blood flow away from the digestive system to support your fight and flight response. An article from Hyperbiotics explains why this hostile takeover by the brain can lead to additional psychological issues um, in the case of persistent stress. It says that ongoing restriction of digestive blood flow brought on by long-term stress takes its toll on the gut in more significant ways than just butterflies though. By reducing microbial diversity and lowering the numbers of friendly flora, thereby creating conditions that encourage undesirable strains 
of bacteria to thrive. Additionally, the immune system, most of which resides in the gut, doesn't receive the influx of fresh blood that it needs to function optimally. So this excerpt really highlights the direct effects of psychological stress on the four to five pounds of microbes that colonize the human body, especially in the gut. Now there are three categories of microbiota in what's known as your microbiome, and these are symbiotic, pathogenic, and commensal bacteria strains. The symbiotic bacteria in your body are often referred to as probiotics. These beneficial bacteria work in harmony with the body to optimize digestion, vitamin absorption, synthesize hormones, regulate immune function, reduce inflammation, support healthy gut lining, and more. And they provide these benefits in exchange for the opportunity to feast on indigestible fiber in your food. The pathogenic variety are harmful microbes that are opportunists. Uh, they live on fats and sugars, etc., found in your diet. Uh, in contrast to the symbiotic bacteria, which offer healthful benefits, um, these microbes will live off your body and will do anything to gain an advantage, um, even if it's at the expense of the host body. And finally, that leaves the commensal bacteria, uh, which live off the body and nutrients like the others do, um, but they don't really offer any known health benefits. Um, that said, if the colonies of commensals are reduced, then it leaves room for other bacteria to take root. Unfortunately, uh, it's most often the more aggressive pathogenic bacteria that went out. Now, an article from John Hopkins Medicine shed some light on the effects of bacterial imbalances. It shares that the enteric nervous system may trigger big emotional shifts experienced by people with irritable bowel syndrome and functional bowel problems such as constipation, diarrhea, bloating, pain, and stomach upset. For decades, researchers and doctors thought that anxiety and depression contributed to these problems, but our studies and others show that it may also be the other way around. Looking at the data from the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and John Hopkins Medicine, uh, we can see that those with IBS and other functional bowel disorders are up to six times more likely to suffer anxiety or depression than is the general population. In fact, an estimated 30 to 40% of people who experience functional bowel issues also experience anxiety and depression at some point. In addition, um, as the U.S. National Library of Medicine article explains, stress and mood disorders compound one another. Several studies show differences in the gut microbiota's composition and function in individuals with major depressive disorder compared to healthy controls. Some data suggests that pro-inflammatory species can dominate at the expense of health-promoting species in depressed individuals. Later, um, in that same article, it continues. Um, existing evidence suggests that bidirectional relationships among stress, mood, diet, and the gut bi microbiota, which ultimately form either a vicious or virtuous cycle, these mind-body, human-bacterial relationships help to explain both resilience and chronic disease. Now, one reason for this connection is the beneficial gut bacteria play a key role in the production of neurotransmitters like serotonin that regulate gut function, mood, memory, and learning. So not only do mood disorders contribute to gut health problems, but gut health problems contribute to mood disorders. Now, I'd like to shift gears a bit and take a look at this through the lens of medical research via animal testing. Um, it turns out that microbes are an essential part of digestion for almost all life on the planet. And given this common design pattern, uh, researchers are able to take a look at the digestive systems of lab animals and discover potential treatments that can benefit mankind. One such study uh, was featured by the American Psychological Association. In it, researchers found that monkeys and mice exposed to persistent stress had reduced diversity of gut microbiome, especially the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. In addition, uh, they suffered an overgrowth of harmful bacteria, uh, resulting in increased susceptibility of infection and gut inflammation. But check out this next article from Forbes. A genetic analysis found genes linked to violent traits switched on, which according to the study, increased growth, movement, and signaling between bacteria and the host. In other words, the bacteria appeared to have turned into destructive pathogens uh, with enhanced ability to travel through the body and infect tissue. Further analysis of lymph nodes of stressed mice found immune stem cells characteristic of autoimmune disease. When taken together, uh, these results suggest that a percentage of stressed gut bacteria in the mice became pathogenic and infected their tissue, resulting in an immune system attacking the body. Amazingly, uh, this study demonstrates that certain genes in good bacteria can be switched on, turning them pathogenic. 
Once barriers such as the gut lining have been compromised, uh, bacteria are able to infiltrate other areas of the body, a condition known as leaky gut. And naturally, um, this triggers inflammation and an immune response, which can lead to a whole host of autoimmune disorders. As an example, uh, consider the H. pylori bacteria, which is a well-known bacteria among acts of reflux sufferers. Uh, many, like me, have been tested for H. pylori at some point uh, to determine if it was a cause of escalating symptoms. Um, amazingly, uh, according to the CDC, H. pylori is estimated to be present in the gut of up to 50% of the global population, yet causes no harm in 85% of those individuals. And it's even been shown in some studies to deliver health benefits. However, when it's allowed to proliferate out of control and turn into a pathogenic bacteria, it becomes a significant cause of digestive disorders. Now, this next bit of research really blew my mind the first time that I heard it. Results from two human studies uh, found that the microbial community of individuals with major depression differs significantly from those of healthy individuals. Um, fecal samples from the depressed volunteers were then transferred into mice via fecal microbiota transplant, which is basically a reverse enema. Um, amazingly, um, these rats began to exhibit behavioral signs of depression. And by the way, um, the technique has actually been shown to be effective in irritable bowel syndrome, as well as reducing the symptoms of some autoimmune diseases, such as Parkinson's and autism. Now, the last set of studies that I want to mention um, demonstrate that by introducing a specific strain of probiotic bacteria called lactobacillus, mice produced lower levels of stress hormones and were less likely to give up and just start floating in a forced swim test. Another study uh, wanted to determine if the enteric nervous system played a role in this three-way communication between the gut microbiome and the brain. This follow-on study repeated the very same experiment, but then cut the vagus nerve, which is the cranial nerve that carries messages from the enteric nervous system into the brain. In these cases, the mice uh, with the surgical removal did not see an improvement of anxiety and depression. Let's do a quick rundown of some of the key takeaways. Um, by looking at several studies, we've established a bidirectional link between the mind, the gut, and the persistent mood disorders that affect the microbial balance of the gut. Also, persistent gut health issues can negatively affect a person's mental state. Given the bidirectional nature, these effects can form a vicious rather than a virtuous cycle, and one of the many mechanisms that can keep you spinning around the reflux cycle. Additionally, the gastrointestinal tract is governed by the body's second brain, the enteric nervous system, which interprets and relays signals from the digestive process, as well as the state of the microbiome or microbial community in the GI tract. In the case of stress, the brain can override the enteric nervous system by diverting blood flow away, and if this is persistent, the microbial community suffers, which can lead to digestive, immune, autoimmune, and mood disorders. Lastly, by looking at animal studies and some human clinical work, we see that the microbial community can be transferred from one host to another, and the recipient can then take on the characteristics of the donor, uh, whether that be good or bad, um, directly implicating these microbes in the resulting physiological and psychological changes. Uh, similarly, our probiotics can have positive benefits provided the enteric nervous system is otherwise intact and healthy. So now we have a high level understanding of how our mental state can impact our physical well-being and vice versa. But what specifically are the implications of microbial imbalance? According to articles from the Institute of Functional Medicine and Atlas Biomed, it is a long list, including reduced commensal bacteria, which opens the door for pathogenic bacteria to overgrow, poor gut motility, uh, which can result in indigestion, bloating, inflammation, reduced immune function, and of course, directly resulting in typical reflux symptoms. Lower nutrient absorption, most commonly B12, magnesium, and calcium for reflux sufferers. For more on this, go to youtube.com slash the acid reflux guy and watch my video called Surprising Acid Reflux Symptoms and Side Effects. Inflammation and compromised immune function, which can lead to inflammatory and cognitive issues, autoimmune issues such as celiacs, allergies, and more. Impaired microbiome regulation, culminating in lower hormone production, leading to anxiety, depression, sleep problems, reduced enteric nervous system function, reduced immune function. Improper autonomic nervous system response, such as rapid heartbeats and other strained sensations, oftentimes after eating. Damaged adrenal function, are resulting in hormone imbalances and more. Reduced vagal tone, eliciting poor digestive function, hormone production, 
or inflammatory and immune responses, leaky gut, and many other unspecified physical challenges. Now I feel it's time for me to come clean on something. Um, I have to admit that when I first began learning about reflux, I kept hearing the term leaky gut. And I ignored it for months, thinking it had to be some term that gained popularity on the internet with very little scientific backing. Later, I came to realize that leaky gut, gut permeability, thin gut lining, thin mucosal layer, all refer to the same thing. And it's indeed a thing. Um, and you know, once this occurs, food contents and pathogens are able to escape the stomach and enter into the bloodstream, where they can cause inflammatory reactions um, throughout the body and the brain. And as I study this further, I now realize this is likely the cause of some of the cognitive issues that I dealt with. Uh, increasingly over 15 years, I had trouble concentrating on the simplest of conversations, often causing me to lose the point or fail to make connections. Uh, this contributed to my growing anxiety and embarrassment in social settings, which made for an incredibly stressful working and personal life. Now I'm going to cut the episode here. Um, there is, of course, a lot more that we could discuss um, in this episode. In fact, my first recording of this episode was over an hour and based on 35 pages of notes. Um, as always, though, the references are in the show notes, so feel free to check out any of those that you want to explore deeper. Now, let me know if I struck a good balance with the details in this episode. You can let me know in the comments or by leaving feedback on the show. Now, speaking of feedback, I'd like to take a quick look at some of the comments that you left on the last podcast episode. Todd said, uh, you're off to a great start with this pilot episode. It's clear that there are two realities when it comes to the use of proton pump inhibitors. On one hand, FDA guidelines state clearly that proper PPI dosage is 20 milligrams daily, and the duration should not exceed two weeks and should not be repeated more than three times per year. On the other hand, physicians are quick to double and even quadruple this dosage and allow the duration to extend months or even years. Vanessa says, thank you so much for this video. Mom and I are suffering with all the same issues and we're relieved to have found your support and a pathway forward. Thank you for your time, understanding and for sharing your gift. Much appreciated. AL says, thank you for sharing what's worked for you and actually having references to studies. May many people find relief from the suffering through your work. Rama says, I'm very much looking forward to your next podcast episode. I'll say a big thank you for, uh, for all your comments thus far. They encourage me and they keep me going. Now, I would love for the show to be crowdsourced and for the direction to be based on your input. So leave me a review, give me some feedback. If you want to learn more about ways that I address some of the physical and psychological effects of reflux, you can go to theacidreflux.com slash get started. My name is Don Daniels, aka The Acid Reflux Guy, and this was episode one of the Reflux Cycle Show, signing off.